emergency plan. First, we decided where to meet. The fire was coming and I knew what we would need. Flashlights, water, condoms, and a shot of our imaginary sun. Only, what I used to call our peeping birds startled me into starting days long before the city bus commenced its run. That's when I knew we hadn't done enough in case the sky fell while I was driving. And I packed a pair of panties, matches, some aspirin in the trunk. After we stopped making breakfast plans, the pecking woke me early, and by breakfast I was always eating lunch. I secreted in my office that little blue box, trail mix, shekels, and seed to plant after the revolution was over and done. I made sure we remembered where we planned to meet, taught us to swim in case we came near water when it decided to flood. But those damn birds with their nesting scattered on the patio were eventually the most reliable alarm. And only to level the threat, I fashioned a carry-all from the pillowcase I no longer slept on. I filled it, tinned meat and crackers, chocolate, a little musk, so I can recall how we smelled before this end was begun. That is the first time I've ever read a poem in San Francisco from Smith Blue, my new book. So thank you. That was fun. And now I'm going to do that thing that poets always do when they read something from the next book, you know? But then I'll go back to Smith Blue. But this poem, I just today, I signed a contract for Poetry Magazine, which made me feel a lot badass. I have been trying to get into Poetry Magazine for approximately 14 years, and I'll send like the little packets of three to five poems that you're supposed to do, and then I'll get the nice little letter back from Christian Wyman saying, thank you, but no. And this time, it was like three o'clock in the morning, and I was tired, my baby had been crying, and I was like sort of revising this poem, I was just like, Fuck it. Here you go. Poetry. Take it. And now Poetry Magazine has accepted a poem with so many bad words in it, I can't show my mom. <laughs> first, from the first, the body was dirt. Whose hands touched first the head of the penis, the shaft? And was it soft or shale, more rock than clay? And who pinched first into their place the small cuffs at the base of the ass? Who was it got down there on whose knees and blew? And was that passion or panic, the machine that drove those exhalations? And how could we rate the power of that breath? breeze or gale or a whisper like the song the little boy sings to the beetle whose small legs moved in tune like his legs. The legs on that first body must have moved if they did move when the dust settled. In my mind, everything's become enormous. But was it ever small like that, the first body? Did, ever, did it ever sit close to the ants and their piles of dirt from which that first body had come? You were a small boy once, I suppose. You were dirty from the start. You showed me how to use a cock ring and why. How, without ever paying for a room, to spend two weeks in any city. How two men could fuck and continue to face each other directly. Took my body and showed me, my back on a table, my knees by my head. Stretched me into seeing you were more than a dog. You must be dead by now, though I don't know whose hands prepared you, whose fingers fingered 
for the final time all that dark and kinky hair. If the first body was made of dirt, in order to plumb the hollow of that first throat, whose thumb first lodged inside the hinge of that first mouth to force it open, to make the tongue so it could work, who shoved inside that mouth the shit of a hundred thousand worms? Coast where he was not welcome. And uh, the title of this poem came from that conversation, and, and he said, if I wrote the poem first, I could have it. <laughs> That's a state I'll never go back to. Once I got over the problem of not knowing how, I couldn't go back to not curbing my tires. But it took a while to get past forgetting to register street cleaning hours and love. Love was my handicap, though I had no permit to hang from my rear view. So I collected seven or ten little slips. I had every intention to pay off, except I skipped town for the summer and tossed them. I skipped town for the summer and returned to find the guy staying in my apartment had tossed them. I'll admit I was relieved not to face these expensive reminders of the girl I'd been, how stupid I was about life in the city, and as I'd finished school, was moving south for good this time. And as I lived, then, in a state of great anticipation, the potential of a record never crossed my mind. But now, on account of those parking tickets, I can't go back there with a car. Though everyone who loves me knows I love that tiny window each October. In the south nub of the state, you can't reach without driving. I missed it once. I waited a whole year regretting the lost chance to track the linden leaves' tiny migrations. The next fall, refusing to endure that state of desolation again, I asked everyone who loves me to meet me just south of the border. We ordered green mussels. We ordered popcorn shrimp. The shrimp beat the mussels to the table. I was the only one who hadn't already filled up on a grande egg, grande egg cream. I drink for pleasure, but since I left that state, I haven't found any delicious enough to entice. So I ate all the mussels. Crouched there later in that state of betrayal that comes from learning some green things aren't good. Considering the law of averages, inertia, that any body in motion stays in motion unless faced with an equal and opposite force. Peer pressure, scatology, the projected near immediate devastation of world rainforests should certain highly populated nations generally adopt the U.S. model of toilet paper consumption. Germ theory, my own role in depressing the mean average of common human hygiene, I knew I never wanted to be anywhere near that state again. With extradition, with reciprocity, I was hardly away at all. When I first rolled over, my parents were pleased, and just as quickly I left the state of never having rolled before. Ditto slumping on all fours to crawling. And once I could walk, we all knew I was never going back. I just pulled myself up and started moving. I grabbed at everything I could reach. Until I learned better, I put my tongue on anything once. I ate papaya straight from the tree, and then I mourned the abject state of created fruit. Fruit I, living in that state, in my ignorance, thought I loved. I denounced such love. I married a local. I taught myself 
how to keep his garden. I swear, I'm staying away from that state for good.